Next, we're going to focus on the best ways to enhance those important relationships with sponsors, customers, the community and, and others. Karen Jeffrey works as a freelance fundraising and business development consultant. And she has worked with a wide variety of businesses across the sectors, but specialises in arts and culture. Karen has lots to share with us today because she has an abundance of knowledge of the funding environment and she develops new revenue streams through sponsorship and corporate partnerships. And she has been working with Belfast International Arts Festival since 2020. So let's hear her pearls of wisdom. Karen Jeffrey, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, Donna. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Not so sure about the pearls oh, bit. Sure. <laughs> I just hope um, I will be going through uh, different case studies from quite different uh, types of events. So I hope everybody can find a relevance across the board from, from what I'm about to go through with you. And I would just like to thank all the previous speakers for their honesty. I mean, it's really refreshing. It does feel like a very safe space, and I will on that basis go into numbers as well. So thank you. The first case study, uh, I worked with the Grand Opera House back in 2013, and we didn't really have any sponsorship apart from the suppliers whose arms we had bent to try and give us um, little pockets of money here and there. So my first task in going in on a project basis, working full time for about 10 months, was to try and find a sponsor so I want to talk you through how I went about that. We had a cultivation evening, and that's something that um, is relatively simple and straightforward to do, although it is expensive and it is resource heavy. So we picked an event, which was Evita, and I did some research on various different corporate companies that could come in that had possibly engaged with the arts or possibly engaged with sports and maybe wanted an alternative to have a sponsorship in a different sector and invited them along, uh, offered them the best seats in the house in the Grand Circle, kept it to a maximum of 40, so it was a manageable number to be able to work the room, had pre-interval and post-show private receptions, just turned it into a money can't buy experience. It was themed on the evening, now Evita obviously is Argentinian, we served the same bowl suppers we served to everybody else, I just gave them Argentinian names, nobody knew any different. <laughs> We also had a very fine Malbec, and uh, that, that ticked that box as well. So um, I got key board members. Now, this is quite important, um, and I'm not slagging off board members in any sense. I sit on two boards myself, and I take my voluntary board um, trustee positions very, very seriously. But occasionally in an organization, you'll have a board member who likes to impress the four ball from the golf club, and who will turn up to events, but won't do what you need, which is to work the room a well-briefed board member who will actually help to sell what you're trying to get across is a very valuable asset to have on a night like that. So we really um, researched and, and chatted to and got the board members who were involved. Um, targets were researched and identified. So the people who were there on the evening, those of us that were going to speak to them, all had an idea of what we were going to say that would be relevant to them and business cards were exchanged to get in touch. So there was no big sell on the night, it was really just come and see us, enjoy Evita, see what this experience would be like for your staff, for your clients. You could have access to this by engaging with us. So develop the relationship, don't ask for money. Not at that stage, that came later. One of the cards I got was from the chief executive of Kingsbridge Private Hospital, a guy called Mark Regan. So I said to Mark, can I have a follow-up meeting? I've got a really sort of innovative, thinking outside the box idea for our pantomime. And I've looked at your website and I see that you're actually trying now to promote a healthcare package for children and families, which grandparents and parents would buy. And in and around Christmas time, it's an ideal gift. So the pantomime was gonna deliver the audiences for that. We had a venue, we had an event that was well established and had a great tradition and resonance with the, the people of Northern Ireland. So I went to see the senior partners in Kingsbridge and I recited a nursery rhyme. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall, Humpty Dumpty had a big fall. All the king's horses <laughs> and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. And I said, King's Bridge? And they all went, oh, 
okay, that's sort of interesting. And then I had a small PowerPoint presentation with a delightful character, um, Humpty Dumpty, who was branded with Kingsbridge and had a bandage across his head. And I said, Humpty is going to be a new character in the pantomime this year. The uh, Kudos, the company that runs the pantomime, have agreed to allow, to allow hum Humpty on stage. He'd been written into a small part. He'll walk on and Mae McFetridge will say, oh no, Humpty, what's happened to you? I had a fall. And then another character would say, you need to go to Kingsbridge, Humpty, and get that fixed. Unfortunately, that other character was Lorraine Chase, who kept saying, you need to go to Knightsbridge. <laughs> and that didn't entirely pre please the sponsor initially, but then because everybody was talking about it and saying, it should have been Kingsbridge, actually, we couldn't have paid for it to work out better. So that was the project, and what it gave was the uh, new family health care package a chance to come to life. People were able to find out about affordable, affordable private health care. The primary audience for the pantomime was the same target audience for Kingsbridge, which was families with children and grandparents. The character was written into the pantomime. Kingsbridge actually commissioned the costume and paid for it, which was another benefit. It was subtle branding. There was a cast buy-in, so different members of the cast would then dress as Humpty. In the interval, they'd go out and shake hands and get photographs taken with the kids. So that was another plus for the sponsor and another nice part of the PR aspect around all of this. Um, we had merchandise, we had Humpty backpacks, and we had little Humpty Dumpty memorabilia that people could buy. And the sponsor also paid for that. We um, added a management charge, and then we gave them the money back that they had had as an outlay. Um, we went to Arts and Business for match funding. Obviously, that isn't applicable to everybody. But we developed a project around Humpty Dumpty, which I'll go on to on the next slide, which was for schools and pantomimes. And Arts and Business decided that was very worthwhile. It was community engagement. It was giving the brand a community face and an altruistic aspect to their work. And that was very successful. So the pantomime, we got a local team of actors and writers, and we created a small pantomime with Cinderella that year. And we took it to four primary schools, north, south, east, and west in Belfast. Uh, we gave them the basic equipment to be able to put on their own pantomime, and the actors worth, worked with them and mentored them. And each of the primary schools put on a pantomime before Christmas for their parents and siblings. Um, one of the schools was Harberton Special School, and a selective mute actually wanted to sing and be a fairy. And the teachers said that when they did their pantomime, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. So this had impact. We kept feeding this back to, to the sponsor and they had that, oh, you know, feeling. So this was building and building. The feel-good factor, the money coming in and the, the, uh, the awareness and brand building going out. So we also then, with the money, we paid for the schools to attend the pantomime in January. So that was win-win for us because we were putting bums on seats and we were also bringing these children who'd never set foot over the front door of the Opera House to a fantastic opportunity to see their Cinderella on the big stage so they could identify with that. Um, we found out that during that time that they don't have really knit nurses anymore in my day or nurses that go around the schools and actually give you, um, you know, general health care advice. So Kingsbridge said they had a team of nurses who would go out to these four schools. They took Humpty with them. Humpty, Tato was another one of our, our sort of ancillary sponsors. Um, for pantomime, they had a bag of tato, a sack of tato crisps and a sack of fruit, apples and oranges and celery. And um, they asked the kids, Humpty asked the children, which would be better for their teeth. And that was just a very, very simple way of integrating that character, of getting out a nice soft message, but getting it across the schools. And then we followed that up with a post-event um, evaluation Obviously, that's a very necessary facet for any funders. So arts and business were very keen to find out how we had evaluated the whole process. And that's just one example of a, a Humpty Dumpty uh, sponsorship that, that worked. So I thought I would share that with you. The actual financial benefit, um, it was 10 years ago, so I think it's safe to, to give out the costs. Um, we got 20,000 in cash sponsorship from Kingsbridge. Arts and business matched that with 15,000. Um, we then were buying pantomime tickets, which, as I said, was win-win for the participating schools. And we engaged with new audiences. A lot of those kids who came to the pantomime then felt confident to go back and say to their families and their parents, 
could we go to that next year? That's a great thing to go to. So going on to um, enhancing your customer relationships, on a generic basis, um, I work with Belfast International Arts Festival, which I will cover at the end, but we don't have um, a site with food stalls. Thankfully, we don't have the mud that goes with that, but what we have is much more conceptual. It's not a three-day event where you can go and you know exactly what you're going to get and people can turn up for the daytime activities, the nighttime activities. It's an event in the evening, usually early evening. So one of the things we do with that is try and create food partners, try and create bar partners so that we can make it a whole experience for the people who are coming to the festival. But I will do a deeper dive into that. So enhancing customer, just to sort of go on to that, um, what we did this year was uh, we had some funding from uh, CQ Bid, and we partnered with local restaurants. So I went around all the different restaurants near the venues that we were using for the festival, talking to the restaurant owners, saying, look, we're bringing the footfall, we're bringing the people here, but we can't feed them. So if you offer a free glass of wine with the main course or a 10% discount, we can then make these people hopefully stay on for the evening, pre-theatre dining, post-theatre dining, or go to one of your bars, if you're a bar owner, for a drink before you go to the show, because the theatre's closed the minute the show's over, or a nightcap afterwards. Uh, we did this on uh, proof of a digital ticket, because all the ticketing now for us is digital. Um, there were a variety of options. There were vegan options, vegetarian options. We made sure that every taste was catered for. We also partnered with local uh, accommodation partners and hotels, and that way we could package up a whole night in Belfast, particularly for southern audiences and for those coming from across the water and further afield. So they could have a hotel in Belfast, they could book that through our website because they could see a special rates, they could get recommendations for a restaurant and post-theatre um, drinks. So the whole night became part of their overall experience, which made them have a better experience in Belfast, spend longer time, spend more money, and also look back on it with a rosy glow because, yeah, that was, that was great, that whole, that whole thing worked. And we packaged up competitions and then we had media partnerships, so we would package up a competition with a, another hotel, a theatre show in the Mac, um, a discounted dinner, and we would run that as a competition then in, uh, in the Irish News, for example, at Belfast Telegraph. So another case study is an actual event that I um, worked on. I left the events industry in 2009, and I was burnt out, I have to say. Um, I was the managing director of Roots, the World Root Development Forum. Most of you probably, I know some of you have heard of it, but most of you probably haven't. So Roots was essentially um, a very simple business model. We brought airlines to a destination, so say Dubai. Brought the airlines there and we covered their costs and they came free of charge. And we had the Dubai Conference Centre and we created a meeting hall at one end and a meeting hall at the other end. And all the airlines, they were the beauty queens, they sat at tables a little flag with Qantas or Jet2 or Buzz Air or Aer Lingus. And then all the airports from around the world sent their marketing teams and they took meeting packages to meet with the airports to discuss new air routes. So everybody in the world went to the one destination. They were all there for three or four days in marketing mode. They had their top team. They had their uh, people from their hinterland. They had their tourism development agency. They would have had maybe local hotel chains. They maybe had the local council. They maybe had um, some other um, quasi-governmental organization with them to support them. So Roots brought all these people together for the purposes of discussing new airlines coming into your destination. Now, Belfast bid for and hosted Roots in 2016, and it was in the ICC. It was a hugely successful event. The economic benefit to the city was just over three million pounds, and at least nine new air services between the airports came out of the conversations that were either started or completed at that event. There was also, um, so Roots itself takes place every autumn, and in the first part of the year, Roots Europe, Roots Americas, and Roots Asia. So when I first went in, my, my opportunity, I was given the, the task of increasing the revenue and also enhancing the delegate experience. 
The event had been going for quite some time, and as somebody rightly pointed out earlier on, it was getting a bit tired. You have to change things up. So we needed to try and um, work better with our delegates, and we needed to, to bring in extra revenue streams. So the first thing I did was um, something I personally believe in, which is always having a charity partner. The harder and the hardcore commercial organization that you are works very, very well to have a charity partner, and it also helps open doors to sponsors. Sponsors um, in this very, very crowded marketplace are constantly being torn, and it's, it's very easy to give to a cause. It's very easy to have your charity of the year as somebody, um, one of your staff has lost, sadly, a child to cancer, as, to a children's cancer charity. It's really hard if you're going in with an arts event or if you're going in with a hardcore commercial event to try and pitch against that. So go together, collaborate. And that way you take two boxes for a corporate sponsor or for somebody who might come in and give you some funding. So I uh, researched for Roots uh, the Flying Eye Hospital. I looked at various other airborne charities and that was the one that was, was international. Um, got them to come to the event in Dubai, gave them a free stand. And as we developed the relationship over six months and give them a lot of online activity and access to our database, um, they said we have a DC-10 um, it's an aeroplane, it's a legendary aeroplane that they had taken, stripped down and turned into a flying eye hospital and a, a teaching clinic. They said, we'll bring that to Dubai. So, okay, so we put the word out on that. Suddenly our delegate numbers started to go up. All the anoraks came out of the closet. Wow, a DC-10. Well, I didn't know what a DC-10 was, I have to say. But they all came out of the closet and they all started to sort of sign up for Dubai. This was great. So that was the first step. Charity made a fortune from their stand because they had games and interactive stuff. Dubai um, Airport Authority didn't charge us any parking fees for having the DC-10. Um, looking back on it, we probably could have charged for that tour. But you live and learn. You know, that year it was free. And the feel-good factor and the increase in delegate sales was enough. Um, the second thing was to create collocated events. So we have this meeting halls, exhibition in the centre. The one thing we were struggling to do was to get the right level of seniority of airline CEOs. So we came up with the idea of having a leaders forum. Now, the guy that owned the company then was, um, to say the least, a misogynist alcoholic, and it was privately owned. And my, my, my job wasn't really made any easier by that. So he wasn't really happy. He, he was the chair and he wasn't very happy having a female MD. He thought it was a great idea at the time, but after about a year of me being there, he thought, no, and she's from Belfast. So I was based in Manchester at the time. So he said, right, this leaders forum that you're going to do, I want Willie Walsh. And I said, okay, right, Willie Walsh, okay. Willie Walsh. So, um, okay, Willie Walsh was the chief executive then, one of the best known airline chief execs in the world. He was British Airways. Um, fear knows no bounds like a fool. So I started networking, going to other people's events and um, a doorstep Willie Walsh. Found out they had a love of Liverpool Football Club and God forgive me, I'm a Chelsea fan, but I swore blind to him. I supported, <laughs> I supported Liverpool and persuaded him to come to our next year's event, which was in Stockholm. And he came to that, and once everybody heard Willie Walsh was speaking, lots of other airline CEOs crawled out too, and we established in the Roots Leaders Forum, which meant that the airline teams were bringing bigger teams, more senior people involved in those teams, and the airports were starting to buy bigger and bigger packages of meetings. So it was a feel-good factor because the senior people, the world leaders in aviation were there, but it was also increasing revenue. So the delegates experience, they're given to charity, they've got their bosses there, it's very senior. Um, and then we introduced a VIP program, which would mean you could bring your partner. Because a lot of, it was a very male-dominated world, aviation still is. Um, name me a few female chief executives of airlines, it's probably going to take you a while. Um, so one of the things we thought, well, bring your partner. If you're going to go to Dubai or Stockholm or somewhere where you're expected to be for three or four days, bring your partner. So we did that and that put up delegate numbers again because that made it easier for people to get a, to get a note or to, to bring a partner and, and then join the event. And then we introduced marketing awards. People love to win awards. So the airports who were paying for the meeting packages, don't forget the airlines are free, we thought they need something back. So we created um, airport marketing awards. Um, they took off and then somebody asked, could they sponsor them? 
one of the suppliers. So that was win-win. That was how we, um, for a large scale, standalone commercial, reasonably successful event, increased the delegate experience, enhanced it for them, increased our delegate numbers, um, consolidated our own position because there was a, an opportunity for various different organisations to step up in competition. And uh, yeah, and Roots has gone from strength to strength. This is the Flying Eye Hospital, just so you can see that uh, it, it's an incredible and does an incredible job. They literally fly into somewhere like Ethiopia. Um, people are escorted onto the plane, they have their cataracts removed and they can walk out and see. So it's a fabulous charity. So those are the financial benefit, benefits. Sorry, I've actually covered those, so I'll not dwell on that now, and I'm mindful of time. So um, my final case study is really about how to enhance your relationship with the community. And that's through Belfast International Arts Festival and our sponsor, Belfast Harbour. This, again, got match funding from arts and business. So we engaged uh, in 2020. That was the year, wasn't it? I kind of blank that from my memory, but uh, in 2020, Belfast, Inter Belfast International Arts Festival went digital. And that gave us, um, well, it gave us a lot of heartache and um, it also gave us an opportunity. Because it was digital, we couldn't charge for it. So because we couldn't charge for it, um, that meant all our events were free. So we started to engage with donors and got in touch with people through our database and through various other media platforms to say, OK, this year, the event is free. It's free for all, um, but it's still costing us money to do it. We'd love your help. And we started to get regular donations. We started to get um, annual donations, and then we've started to develop those into monthly donations. It's much more difficult to do now that events are paid for, but that free time gave us the opportunity to start and engage with those people. The second strand of that was um, when we started to get paid for events, we wanted to be able to bring some of the people who had watched for free for various reasons to our events. Now, some of them watched for free because they couldn't afford to go to events, and some of them watched for free because they weren't comfortable going into a theatre. They said, it's not for me. There's nobody that looks like me there. I've got, um, I've got issues with walking. I'm not sure if I would fit in. I'm not sure where I would sit. Um, I've got, I'm neurodiverse. I'm not sure if it would be too loud. I, I'm just, just not comfortable. So we wanted to get to those people in their communities and bring those with us back into the theatre once we went back to live events. So in 2023, um, our third year of this, we got the money from Belfast Harbour and we started very small. We started engaging with local communities like Sailor Town, who were a neighbour of the harbour. And then we started engaging with various children's groups, refugee groups, um, uh, traumatised young mothers, um, people who had suffered during the troubles from the, uh, from the peace line. And we went out and met these people in their communities and took the festival to them. We brought the brochures, we brought uh, online videos, and we tried to show them that really this was, this was for them. And that was what the money from the festival was to do, was to buy tickets for these people, to give them the opportunity to come to live experiences. So we sent a detailed, um, we, we made sure we had a point of contact with the community leaders, community leaders. And we sent a detailed venue walkthrough, a little video clip, for example, of the Opera House. So this is how you go in and this is where you go and these are where the toilets are so that people felt familiar. Um, we got permission to interview and film and that was a fantastic um, opportunity for us to actually get, with written permission, these people on film um, who looked from, uh, who represented various different groups, but particularly who looked into the camera and told us what a wonderful, wonderful experience this had been for them. It was life-changing for many of them. And uh, with their permission to, the sh to show that, we have used that since. Um, and it's great to be able to give back to our statutory funders because it's something that we can show then to them as proof of our diversity, but also to say, look, this is where, you know, you're maybe pro, uh, project funding, but this is where our generic funding goes. And this is the sort of initiative that we want to have to make sure we're accessible to all. So the follow-up of that was um, we visited, uh, we're visiting at the moment because the partnership enabled us to enter the Arts and Business Awards. And we were very lucky this year to win for um, commitment to diversity. So we are um, proud holders now of that endorsement. And we're taking that 
word out to the various groups. And our next stage is to develop further the number of community groups that we can reach. Um, through the, the money we got from arts and business, we we're able to transport these groups safely to the, to the venues. When we did our evaluation after year two, we discovered there were a lot of no-shows. And we asked the community leaders why, for example, did this group of, of refugees from um, Glen Gormley, from the hotel where they are, not come to the festival? You know, they, they loved the idea. They, they were delighted to have free tickets. And they said, there's no way of getting there. We said, oh, what do you mean? Could they not get the bus? 15 single immigrant guys walk through Glen Gormley to get the bus? No. It's not going to happen. So we got many buses, and that's where the funding from arts and business was used. The financial benefits to that, um, I can't at this stage disclose because it's an ongoing sponsorship, but cash sponsorship to, com to purchase community tickets, um, PR support, which again is invaluable from a commercial sponsor, um, the arts and business match funding to provide transport, an opportunity for us to increase and diversify our audiences, we were eligible for the awards, and it proves our diversity to statutory funders. So just touching uh, Arts Festival, Belfast International Arts Festival, as, as um, the Balmoral Show is, is a charity, a not-for-profit organisation. So for us, statutory uh, funding tends to cover projects and development, but we still need very much money towards core costs. And where we look for that, the drivers are donors, which can lead to legacies. Um, collection at events, if we're having a free event, we do have one or two free events a year. Um, we get a license from the PSNI and run a street collection. People are happy to give, as they did when it was digital, when it's a free event. To have a feel-good factor, if they've enjoyed themselves on the day, they'll happily put their hands in their pockets. A friends of scheme, we could do an afternoon on that and corporate membership, which we have just launched last week for Belfast International Festival. Um, that has taken us two or three years to get off the ground because it's very resource heavy. And as like others have referred earlier on, sometimes sponsorship comes at a very high cost in terms of the, the time and the resources that you need internally to manage it, especially if you've set high expectations. Um, with corporate membership, we think we've finally hit it now where we can manage it internally and deliver externally to make it successful. Um, sponsors cash and sponsors in kind. Again, somebody mentioned in kind. In kind is great. Um, if you have to have a reception for your VIPs, have a drink sponsor. They may not pass over any money, but if they bring along the drinks and serve them on the evening, um, there's value for both. You're giving them a brand platform and they're giving you a cost saving because you don't have to then spend that money. And patrons, um, high net worth individuals, again, in this Northern Ireland, it's a village. Um, there's only a handful of them, they're hard to get. We probably all want to reach them, and as a result, they lock themselves away in ivory towers. But um, if you can, through cultivation, through contacts, through your board, through networking, um, if you can make contacts and are lucky, the ultimate sponsor is an altruistic high net worth individual who will say, there's 20 grand, I just like the arts. So thank you very much. Take a seat there. Yeah. Get a drink of water. So ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a couple of questions um, for Karen there, if you could again put up your hands. Um, I, 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 her talk was, was most interesting. It's looking at different revenue streams, not just the usual ones, thinking outside the box, the old cliche. Um, any questions from the floor? There you go. Nicola, one of our speakers. It's all about sharing, Nicola, isn't it? So, Nicola Meadley. Thank you. Um, your Humpty Dumpty case was just fantastic. Yeah. Congratulations on that. It's brilliant. Curious to know the school sort of activity that you did. Were you going to do that anyway, or was that driven by the objectives of Kingsbridge? No, that was something that um, was driven by Kingsbridge, having sort of started that relationship and had various discussions. And to be honest, <clears throat> the schools that we picked were in an area of depravity. So they weren't what you would traditionally think of as Kingsbridge potential clients, you know, those that could afford private health care. But this was a very affordable private health care package. And Kingsbridge, while launching that, also had this altruistic desire to be able to give back. They didn't want to be seen to be too elitist. 
So this was an offset for them. This was an opportunity for them to be soft and warm and fuzzy through Humpty and to go into those schools and, and give the talks. I mean, let's face it, they weren't going to be potential customers. So that was an actual sort of act of charity. But it came about as part of the campaign and it helped unlock the funding to arts and business because they're all about community. You know, that's all very well. You have a pantomime, yeah, well, you have that every year and you sell tickets for it. You know, it's commercial. So what are you going to do that's different? Well, we're going to take the pantomime out into the community. Anyone else? Hands up. What I thought was interesting, you were talking about um, the refugees in, in Glengormley. From your experience, are there audiences or customers out there that are untapped? And I know myself from um, working with people who have both seen and unseen disabilities, that often they think that's not for me, for me that event, that live event, whatever it is, be it indoor or outdoor. So do you think there are untapped customers there that we should be, we should be thinking Absolutely. of in regard to events? Totally. Um, with, with the festival, I sat down and looked at the programme last year because we'd gone up to see Ark Housing and that's where a lot of the Syrian and um, Eritrean refugees live. And we met with the mums. The kids were all... Uh, their English was superb. The kids were all running around. They were lovely children. They were so happy. A lot of the mums, their English was coming on, but I was talking to two or three of them. One was a pharmacist. Another was a doctor. Another was a university lecturer. And they can't even get jobs as cleaners. But they love arts. They love culture. And they know that they've chosen Northern Ireland. may have not have been what they set out to do initially, but for reasons beyond their control, they had to live somewhere else. So they had to move to another country. So they want to make the best of it. And we had a Moroccan circus troupe coming in. So I showed pictures to the kids. And a couple of mums were going, they look like us. This is great. We're seeing people on a stage in Northern Ireland who look like us. So they felt welcome. And we've also captioned and we've had audio descriptions so we can bring people who are either D-deaf or visually impaired. Because we want to say, right, access to the arts is for everyone. So we want you to come as well. So there definitely are audiences that are untapped. And then there are those that think the theatre is not for us. The first time we had the community ticket scheme and we brought a group of women down from the, from the Peace Line, from the Shankill, they had never been to the Mac Theatre before. And they uh, weren't very appropriately dressed. Um, you, you'd have thought they were Goodness going... Goodness knows what that means. Well, you'd, have thought they were going, you'd have thought they were going to a nightclub. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. Like, I wear more going to bed, okay? So, like, they had they bar barely there, and they had carry-outs, and they had obviously had a few drinks before they came. That was a good night out for them. It was a brilliant night out yeah. for them. But you know what? The, the, the audience loved their joy. The mm. performance had never had a standing ovation like it, and they had never heard people whip for contemporary dance. Brilliant the way they did. It was only my boss was having apoplexy in the back seat. But no, it was just wonderful. And, you know, coming out, they were going, well, it was okay. It wasn't really our thing, but we might try something else. That's all you could ask for. That's all you want. Is somebody to say, hmm, or maybe it just makes them think or takes them out of their despair for an hour or two, you know? Mm -hmm. Anyone, uh, any one, anyone from the floor? Any, just at the back there. If you could just wait a second until we get the, the microphone too, so that we can <laughs> hear. If you could introduce yourself and, and where you've, you've come from, who you represent today. Yes, I'm um, Michelle Baird. I'm head of marketing and corporate fundraising for the Ulster Orchestra, um, who many don't know we are actually a charity, a registered charity. Karen and I know each other really well. Can I just say, um, first of all, thank you for raising awareness of how the funding challenges that there are there for the arts sector um, is just constant and we feel like we're constantly firefighting and especially for us, we don't own the venues that we perform in as well. And I started doing corporate fundraising was tagged on to my marketing job just because I have plenty of time um, last year. <laughs> so we relaunched our corporate membership scheme and we're trying to get sponsors and it's slow. There's a lot of chatting and networking. But again, as I said, because we're limited in space and, and all of that, um, for me, it would be really useful to find out exactly what sponsors want from going to a concert and a night out and how we can help them um, 
have a platform um, to sell their wares to our audiences because there is a lot of alignment there. We're getting a lot of the time, you no, know, our organization just wants to fund golf and rugby constantly. Uh, <laughs> well, no, if you go to the arts, you can bring your partners, you can bring your children, you can bring your grandparents, you can bring whoever. Um, and we're very proud to be part of Belfast International Arts Festival as well. So yes, any hints and tips on fundraising and sponsorship please throw them my direction at the end of the event but thank you that was a really, really good everything you're saying Michelle yeah I think and you so rightly pointed out we are a charity and you're a charity and so many people don't realize that and think that you know big organization out there must have lots of money and yet you know it's and it's dog eat dog out there you know in terms of trying to compete for the sponsors pound um and we don't have the emotional pull on the heartstrings that so many of the traditional charities have. Actually, one of the organisations it's very good to get involved with if you are a charity, in fact, even if you're not, is the Chartered Institute of Fundraising in Northern Ireland. And steal what the cancer charities do. Take the ideas that they've spent years developing and coming up with. There's a lot of learning across the sectors, and maybe that's something we should all do more of. Maybe cross that divide between the arts and the healthcare sectors. Yeah. Well, like yourselves as well, our... our Orchestra is the only orchestra in the whole of the UK that our players built into their contracts is learning and community engagement work. So yeah. it's part of their salaried work. So we're out and about to deprived areas and schools and working with community groups all the time. Um, so maybe that's an area that we should focus yeah. on and getting the money for. You mentioned, for. Karen, about partnering up maybe with other charities, those who are not necessarily seen as a charity or those that maybe healthcare charities that are very upfront and uh, the benefit that, that that would bring what do you think oh absolutely hugely um peter Carey runs an event um he used to do it in the in the waterfront and now he does it in uh, the uh, st anne's cathedral yes. and he got i was involved with him for a while and we got spar on board as a sponsor and uh they were sort of humming and hard about how much they were going to give and what the value was and we brought in a charity, which was Angel Eyes, and we gave them the opportunity, fully branded, to sell the programmes in the foyer. And uh, they, they had collection buckets around the place. So Spar went, oh yeah, and that's children who are visually impaired. And that resonated with somebody who had a niece or a nephew who had gone through some sort of eye issue and as a result didn't have full sight. So um, it's just getting through um, and having meaning. That's what, I mean, corporates want stories to tell now. They want meaning. So if you can bring along a charity partner, so if you're having a particular event, um, if we're having a particular concert, maybe in the Ulster Hall with the Ulster Orchestra, and we decide to bring the Simon community in and let them do a collection that night on the door and maybe have some reference to them or have something as well that they can sort of grab onto to give it meaning for them, that's going to go down very well with sponsors and with corporates. Because just saying, oh, yeah, so homeless charity and, and the arts... Okay, Karen Jeffrey, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thanks, Karen. Thanks.